read the manual. That is how I wish I could start every stability letter. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. Naval architects and engineers, we admittedly create a lot of boring reports. Uh, but a stability letter is not one of them. It looks like another boring report, but it really acts as a safety manual. Ignore it at your peril. Preparation is key when you're going to see and the exact details of that preparation change depending on the specific ship you're on. A stability letter is the manual that explains many of those details for your specific ship. Now the problem with stability letters isn't the math, it's communication. These are not easy documents to read and they are very boring. In fact, this video was inspired by another article I read in Maritime Technology by Darren Manzingo. He explained that for small vessels, the major problem with stability letters is explaining it to the captains. And there's a beautiful quote from that article. Backed into a corner and left to their own devices, our mariners will disregard the stability guidance and do what they know has worked before. Nobody has walked them through the contents of their stability letters one sentence at a time to make sure they understand it. So today, that's what we're doing. I will review a stability letter and give plain English interpretation for all of that boring mumbo jumbo. Let's do this. First, a bit of context. What on earth is a stability letter or a stability booklet? Those two terms often get confused and used interchangeably, but they are in fact two different types of stability documents. First came the stability booklet which we still use for big ships. These books act as instructions for planning a ship voyage. They're kind of like a choose your own adventure novel. They give the data and the equations to determine your own limits for your ship loads. These are more flexible, but they're also more complicated. Stability letters are a simplified version of the stability booklet. They're usually used on smaller ship vessels. The key difference is the stability letter doesn't allow flexibility. It only gives one set of operating limits for the ship, but there's no math required for the master of the ship. So let's take a look at this. We have the introduction to the letter. This stability letter is for a small passenger vessel regulated by the United States Coast Guard. And I hid all of the information that would identify the vessel to protect my client. The first thing we notice is that the stability letter came from the Coast Guard, not a naval architect. Ship owners hire the naval architect who performs the analysis and recommends limits for the vessel, but for passenger vessels, U.S. Coast Guard has the final say. In this case, only USCG has the authority to provide a stability letter, which is why we see it's their name on the top. And we start off with some boring language. The first line is really easy to forget. You are responsible for maintaining the vessel in a satisfactory... <sighs> now what that really means is that no science in the world can guarantee your safety. This stability letter is guidance, but not a guarantee. The master of the ship, you do whatever you need to so that you can ensure the safety of your vessel. It's ultimately your authority and your decision. The end of that first paragraph also provides a critical hint for when you should check your stability letter. After loading and prior to departure. The most important limit for a stability letter is the limit on draft. More on this later. And the most important time to check that draft is right before departure. Don't depart too heavy or with too much trim on your vessel. The last item I want to highlight for now is the deadweight survey. A deadweight survey is a technique we use to determine the weight of the boat. For now, just focus on the date of that deadweight survey. If that date is 5 to 10 years old, this entire stability letter may be outdated. It could be questionable. 
Ships change a lot in five to ten years. Still awake? Good. Because now we're coming to the important part. The operating restrictions. These tell you the things that you cannot do. The first one is the route. This vessel was limited to protected waters. These are key words, protected waters, and they're part of a stupid naming convention used by the US Coast Guard. The Coast Guard divides the ocean into three major classes of operation, mainly dependent upon the weather. That's on the table on your screen. Now, as the operator and the master of the vessel, you need to keep the boat within the limited region at all times. At all times is key. You don't know exactly why that route restriction was put in place. We don't provide those details in a stability letter. I actually knew one operator that thought it only applied when they had passengers on board, and so they took a boat that was only rated for harbor conditions and drove it across the Gulf of Mexico for a delivery. Now, I can't speak for the Coast Guard, but I can definitely say they were outside the vessel's limits for that trip. Now that's a pretty obvious example. A boat designed for harbor can't go out on the open ocean. But for some regions, like the intracoastal waterway on the south coast of the United States, the classification is not obvious. If in doubt, call up the local Coast Guard sector. They will know the answer. They have to. Each Coast Guard command acts as its own fiefdom, aware of their own local conditions for their region. They know the weather, and they will be able to tell you the exact operating region that you're allowed to stay in with your stability letter. Just remember to use these key words here of protected, partially protected, or unprotected waters. Time for some more boring language. Yay! The first one is the standard language referring to the Certificate of Inspection, COI. The reason they reference the COI is because the stability letter only deals with route restrictions based on stability. The COI also considers items like life-saving equipment. Sorry about this, everyone. You have to be the person that sits down with both documents and compares between them to find the most restrictive limits. Okay, enough paperwork. Let's get to the big restriction. 40 persons or less, 38 of which are passengers. Huh? This is very specific wording. Persons is anyone with a heartbeat on board the ship. That's passengers or crew. Passengers are all of the people who are not crew. So to rephrase this in simpler language, you can't have any more than 38 passengers on board, and you can have two or more crew on board, but no more than 40 people total. No more than 40 heartbeats on board. And babies and children each count as one person. Also notice that weight per passenger of 185 pounds. Don't worry about this one. You don't have to weigh each person as they step on board. The story behind this little number here? Americans are getting fatter. Now, sitting in 2022, it's 185 pounds per passenger. Because we're all gaining weight. So, I don't know, offer people low-fat food on your cruise? Freeboard and draft comes next. See, even with the number of passengers, your ship still has a weight limit as well. We need some reserve stability. Freeboard is the distance from the deck edge down to the ship's waterline, where it's currently floating at. The next time you have the ship out of the water, measure this minimum freeboard on your hull and paint a little short line there. If you see that paint line go underwater, you know right away that you have too much weight on board the ship. Modifications. The next two paragraphs are standard lines, but important ones. First, don't modify the ship without an engineering review. As a commercial ship, you're obligated to inform Coast Guard about changes to the boat and to prove that those changes are safe. The second statement is one that I'm hoping is a little more obvious. Don't leave hatches open that will allow a giant wave to swamp your ship. This also applies to smaller openings, like tank vents and doorways. Now, I'm not saying make all of those watertight. You need some of those openings. For example, we need vents to supply air to the engines. Kind of critical. Walk the deck and be aware of your hull openings. And don't flood the ship. Weight changes. Ugh! Talk about boring. 
Look, I, I know it's boring, and this is probably the worst type of paperwork you can imagine, but it can help you in the long run. Everybody loves to modify their boat. Whether it's a fresh coat of paint or some new machinery, changes will happen on your boat. But all of those changes also alter the ship's weight. Now, when Coast Guard wrote the stability letter, they measured that boat with a specific weight and center of gravity. Too many changes and the stability letter is no longer valid. Now you do have a slight margin for things to change without needing to suddenly pay for a naval architect. But the sidebar to this is keep track of those weight changes so that you're not caught by surprise. Otherwise they can trigger a recheck of the stability letter when you're least expecting it. I created a whole separate article about tracking weight changes called Stability Decay. You can check that out for more information. Oh, and here's an innocent little phrase. The vessel has no fixed ballast. Okay, what does that mean? Fixed ballast is a trick that we use to fix older vessels that might have problems with stability. We're adding weight low in the vessel. The stability letter points out if you have fixed ballast because you need to treat it as sacred. If you have fixed ballast, don't move it, don't remove it, don't touch it. Just like the counterweight on a crane, that fixed ballast is doing a job, keeping you from capsizing. Next, we've got a whole bunch of boring statements that basically can be summarized as manage the ship well. First are the tanks and bilges. These both focus on limiting the free surface moment of your tanks. Your ship doesn't have an infinite tolerance for free surface moment. Too much and the ship capsizes. The calculations behind this letter allowed for a very limited amount of free surface moment. Now that limit is achievable for your vessel because it was calculated for your specific ship, but it's not an infinite limit. It's your job to keep free surface moment to a minimum. Unless you're actively managing or transferring liquids, keep your cross connects closed. This also includes any connections in a manifold. We don't want liquids just randomly shifting from one tank to the next. Now I want you to look down at the bilge of your engine room. Ugh. Oil and water starts to accumulate in the bilge. We want it to go there, but we don't want it to add up to a huge amount. Otherwise it starts to act like another tank on your ship. We want to keep that bilge dry. But how dry, you might ask? How much is too much in the bilge? Well, this is the real world where we can't pump out the bilge every single second. So here's my general rule of thumb. If you can see a visible pool of liquid that's rolling back and forth with the ship, that's too much bilge water. It's time to pump out. And then we throw in a general warning here about ship list. A healthy ship does not normally list. If your ship is listing, run through a mental checklist to see if there are any other potential problems, like say cross connects or water in the bilge. Freeing ports. Funny fact, the ship that matches this stability letter doesn't even have freeing ports. Some parts of the letter are just standard text and don't even apply to you. Sorry, Coast Guard writes them, not me. But many working boats will have a large working deck in back, and that deck is protected by high bulwarks. Basically, the jumbo version of a cargo bed in a pickup truck. Problem is, if a large wave washes over that deck, it's going to fill the entire working deck and turn it into a swimming pool. One that is far too large and far too wide for your ship. We need to drain the water from that deck fast. As a general rule of thumb, all of those thousands of gallons of water should drain out in 30 seconds or less. This is the job of your freeing ports. These are large openings in the bulwarks that are covered by hinged steel flaps. If the deck fills up with water, that water pressure opens all of these freeing ports, creating lots of openings to quickly drain the water. Unless the freeing ports don't work. Like everything else on a ship, freeing ports can get rusted and stop moving. And really, what the stability letter is saying, grease the bearings on the freeing port, and before going into a storm, kick each of them to check that they all work. Jeez, 
Even I'm bored now, but I promised you I would go through every single line, and that's what I did. I know stability letters are boring, and they're full of a lot of useless standard text. My trick is that I normally scan through them looking for the important parts. So let me finish with some simple advice that's going to focus on 90% of the problems that stability letters are meant to address. Number one, skim over your letter and highlight any numbers. These numbers are the most important parts. Plan ahead when modifying your boat. Every change affects your ship's stability. Consider that before you buy your equipment. And then number three, free surface moment is your enemy. Do everything you can to minimize it. These three items are the best advice that I can give. And I will even go one step further. Send me your stability letter and I will provide a free one hour phone call to review the letter, provide a simple explanation and some basic advice. That's the major intent behind stability letters. Advice. As the master of the ship, you have the ultimate authority on how to manage your vessel's stability. It's your ship, your crew, your decisions. The stability letter is only trying to give advice for making good decisions. Thank you very much. I am Nick, the Naval Architect. Wait, 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 don't go away. Keep listening to the sales pitch, and you can tell your boss that you're doing business research. And when you talk to DMS, ship design is business. We are here to redefine how you use your ship, changing it from an expensive cost item to an asset that helps you achieve your business objectives. Let's focus on making this a performance-based tools and find engineering solutions to increase your profit margin. If you want to learn more about how we can help you out with those solutions, give us a call. Thanks very much.